Hey everybody, it is two off the first. It is April the 4th, 2023. I'm Ryan Balaji, good to have you here with us. We've got two stories to talk about. We're getting ready for the Masters. Uh, we've got some news on the Live versus PJ Tour versus DP World Tour front. We'll talk about that at the outset, and then we'll continue to get ready for the Masters tournament, which the, past, the Part 3 contest is tomorrow on Wednesday. Very exciting. And then we're going to have so much to talk about over the next several days, but uh, I, uh, and from tour, news conferences and things like that, but I do want to talk a little bit about Tiger Woods' comments, uh, a bunch of different things that he said in the news conference that he had today, uh, a couple of headlines, one about Rory McIlroy, one also about rolling back the golf ball, so we'll get to that as well. But let's start with news from overseas and the arbitration hearing that happened between and the final results that are apparently going to be made public soon, but not entirely made public today. The Times, I believe it was the first report that the DP World Tour is going to win or has won their arbitration case against Live players who had sued seeking to not be penalized for playing in unauthorized events, i.e. the Live Invitational Series last year, and for the right to continue to play on the DP World Tour as they wish while playing on Live. As it turns out, according to the Times, the players have lost that suit or have lost that arbitration case, which means the DP World Tour can not only prevent these players from having membership and playing on their tour, but also could fine them, could also ban them from competing in the Ryder Cup as well, although, frankly, at this point, they're not a threat to qualify for the Ryder Cup. So, unless you're turning to Luke Donald and begging him not to pick some of the live guys to be captain's picks, which I don't think is the case, then I don't think that really matters all that much. So this was one of those things that a lot of Live supporters were hanging their hat on with the hope that they would win the arbitration case and that would allow players en masse to join the DP World Tour and compete on the DP World Tour as they wished if they weren't required to follow any specific requirements or the DP World Tour couldn't sanction them. And that way they would be able to compete off of the majors and off of the 14 events that they have on the Live Golf schedule, and then they would be able to earn world ranking points, bolster their world rank, and buoy their events, and buoy their ranking to the point that maybe they would then get points from the official world golf ranking, and it wouldn't create this self reinforcing spiral where all of the Live Golf players lose all of their standing in the ranking. Now that that is not happening, and that the official world golf ranking is still obviously very early into what could be a year, year and a half, two-year review of the Live Golf product and whether it merits earning world ranking points, which, by the way, you have now the recusal of Keith Pelly and Jay Monahan, which should have happened at the start, to be honest. But those guys are now out of that decision-making process. But that doesn't mean it's going any quicker. It's still going to take time to happen. And so they've got to figure out how they're going to award points to Live if they're going to do that. And what that looks like, do you get 75% of points because you only played three rounds? Is there a cap because they've only allowed developmental tours to do this with 54 holes? There's a lot of stuff that needs to be decided. It's going to take some time, and they're going to slow walk it too. So by the time we get there, it, it's probably going to be too late, even if they do get points, because you're going to have the same 48 players that are competing against each other just spreading around the same points. Kind of the point of the official World Golf Ranking System is a co-mingling of tours so that you can dramatically move up the ranking if you play well on a better tour or a tour that gets more points or in the majors that get 100 points to the winner. If you can't do that, and, and this week is obviously a big mile post for the, for the live folks in that battle of perception and also points, if you can't do that, then your tournaments are effectively meaningless. That's kind of what happens with the Asian tour or has historically happened with the Asian tour where you can give yourself bonus points because of the players only back in the day. Well, that they, they just fought for points amongst each other, and it never really seemed to improve things unless you had a dominating player who then went did well elsewhere and brought some points back by virtue of their world ranking. It, it's, a, it's a convoluted mess. But the end result is the DP World Tour doesn't have to host live players anymore, and they don't even have to pretend to, which means you're not going to see Lee Westwood or Ian Poulter or Patrick Reed or, I mean, go down the line of guys... Who, want, who have already played a, a DP World Tour event this year because they wanted to play some Rolex Series stuff before Liv started, now they're not even eligible to play. The, the DP World Tour is going to take care of that, and, and they will clear the ranks. 
And what that means then is if these guys want to try to earn world ranking points, the only way they're going to be able to do it is on the Asian tour or hoping the official world golf ranking body gives them world ranking points, which again, seems unlikely to happen anytime soon. So now another legal battle, another important legal decision goes against Liv and they're running out of avenues to try to find relevant world ranking points before it's too late. Pretty much everybody is going to fall off an official world golf ranking cliff come June or July. If you're one of the original players who joined Live, that's when you join the series. And so you're going to start shedding points, and you're also going to start coming up against the minimum divisor. Because if you play 14 events on Live, and they obviously had 8 last year, but if you play the 14 events on Live and you qualify for the 4 majors, you play 18 events. Well, to not be affected negatively by the minimum divisor, which says you have to play 20 tournaments a year, you got to add some more, which means you got to play either Asian Tour events or you've got to find places to play golf elsewhere that count for substantial world ranking points that you can gain. And that means, frankly, not playing the Asian Tour or doing it all together very soon. Because as you lose those points, as you shed points and your divisor becomes the minimum divisor because you're not playing enough, you're going to plummet very quickly, which means you could have someone like Dustin Johnson fall out of the top 200 and top 400 of the world very quickly, very, very quickly. And I, I, I guess the live pushback is going to be, well, look, we're just not going to acknowledge the official world golf ranking. We'll care about the SI world golf ranking or some other person's so data golf system, although data golf is not particularly kind to live players. I mean, Gordon Sargent is ranked ahead. The, the head amateur, the lead amateur in the world is ranked ahead of Brooks Kepka in the data golf ranking. So you take from that what you'd like. But if, if you're thinking about as live ways to try to combat this, you can't from a, an administrative standpoint or a legal standpoint, you're going to have to do it from a, a marketing standpoint. Do you come up with your own ranking? Do you acknowledge that the other tour exists? And not that they haven't done that, but do you acknowledge that in a ranking that puts some of their players ahead of yours and you come up with your own system? I don't know. That would be kind of shooting yourself in the foot to try to rank your own players. I'm not sure that works out very well. No, no ranking system is especially kind to live right now. And I don't think there's going to be one that, that will be because there's no reason to be. We, we did something about this in trying to compare players this week, the live golf players to the PJ Tour regulars competing in the Masters. And we came with this, I tried to come up with a statistic that might be able to do that. And so I came with strokes gained, we call it strokes gained elite, but the idea is strokes gained top third of the field. So the top 16 the ties in every live event did average scores by round and then compared player scores against that. And then we did that for the top 40 in ties in PGA Tour events because they have fields of 120, 132, 144, and 156. And you do have some limited field stuff, but not yet. Yeah, really, the only one there is the event that's the WGC match play, and that doesn't have strokes gained. So we didn't have that in the calculation. And if you looked at the comparison between PGA Tour players and Live players, using that metric, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but it was a baseline. Live guys aren't even close. It's not good. There's too much of a randomized set of outcomes in Live and too few outcomes and too few rounds to normalize it so that you get the most consistent players, the best players competing on the same level of golf as the best players on the PGA Tour. Again, I'm not trying to say that that's the definitive way to compare the two, but trying to do that from a, a betting, a wagering perspective this week for our podcast, The Press, it's not that close. And so now you're going to fight a perception battle. I don't know that you can win unless, unless, and the big unless is unless you go and win the Masters as live this week or you get into a playoff and lose or something like that happens. And that happens not just one major, but at like two of the four. If that happens, then maybe you can turn the tide. Maybe you can at least gain some fans from the perspective that the quality of golf is somewhat good on lib, but you're going to have the same bottom feeders pretty much every week on the product. So Juan Kim is, I mean, way out of his depth, unfortunately, this season. I just not playing well. Phil Mickelson isn't really a real golfer on live. Bryson isn't a real golfer on live most weeks uh, so far that he's moved over. Bernd Wiesberger has been terrible. I mean, you just again and again and again at every live event, you have about 20 to 30% of the field that just frankly is not competitive with the rest. 
and that is a big problem from a perception standpoint. So you either got to replace those players very quickly and hope they perform better, or you have to find a dominating player who is dominant with a couple of other players that are relevant together. And I think they were trying to come up with that last year with the four aces team, but then at the end of the day, you're trying to acknowledge that Taylor Gooch, who is a good player, by the way, and Pat Perez are elite players. And I don't think you can make that case. And I don't think you can do it with a straight face. So now what do you do if you're live? I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I do get the sense that this is another one of those kind of walls closing in moments. Not to say the business is doomed or anything like that. And we don't have any ratings for Orlando, by the way, for their last event. Uh, but the ratings for the Texas Open were down, I think, like 20, 22% somewhere in there. Uh, and I think that has a large function to do with what the reality is going to look like for non-designated events moving forward. And you're going to get a pop for the designated ones, uh, for the non-designated ones. I think that's just going to be the way it is for a while. It's the reality of it. But the ratings were also down for the Augusta National Women's Am this year. It was a great weekend, great weekend of sports. Something like 10 million people watched the LSU Iowa title game. That's incredible. It's the most watched women's basketball telecast of all time. It's not even close. It's 100%, like double the audience of last year between Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. I mean, a real moment. Uh, but that obviously takes away from a t potential audience to watch Sunday golf tournaments. So something to keep in mind there uh, with the NCAA tournament, as we talked about last week, potentially being a factor. Well, both tournaments turned out to be a factor because they were both excellent, although UConn just smoked San Diego State. So maybe that wasn't the best finale to a really good tournament. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Tiger Woods in our second story today, second topic today. Tiger Woods had his news conference today ahead of his participation in the Masters this year. He's asked pretty much all kinds of different subjects. You know, the, the fluff questions he typically gets from different elements of the media, some interesting questions about favorite memories and his history and whether he thinks he can compete. And, and I think because he knows this golf course, he kind of feels a little bit more confidence, well, a lot more confidence here than any other major because, one, he did it most recently. I mean, it's only been four years since he last won the Masters title, although that came after a 14-year wait. But he's done it more recently. He's played well in this tournament, obviously. He made the cut last year. He did say that his leg tends to ache more now than it did last year because last year when he played and made the cut, he wasn't really, what he said, pushing his body to perform for golf, and it took him a while to recover. Now he's kind of got this dull ache that happens because he's trying to push himself more. I think that's interesting to note, and obviously with the poor weather forecast that's expected, that may hurt his chances this week of making the weekend or contending in any kind of capacity. But it still does feel like he feels like there's a reason to be here and he feels relevant, which I, that's the wild thing about golf. Uh, it truly is. But to some of the things that he said in his news conference, other than his, assessing his chances to win, though it was very important that he came out today in favor of a golf ball rollback, in favor of the model local rule proposed by the USGA and the RNA to change how golf balls are tested and measured for you know, being able to be in play, uh, to be conforming. And he said he's all for it because he thinks there should be a pro ball, there should be a ball that's different than the ball that an amateur or recreational player can play that makes the game easier, more fun for them. But for the best players in the world, they should have to play a more difficult, difficult to control ball. Obviously, he's kind of biased in that regard. He has long played a ball that is spinnier than others because he grew up playing a ball out of ball, a wound ball, and then went to the solid core ball. And modern equipment, frankly, does make it easier for players to compete in a more uh, compact, you know, the, the difference between top and bottom is much smaller in many ways because of the things we've learned about the golf swing and efficiencies and power, but also because of the equipment in large part because you can hit it as far without quite as much effort because shafts are amazing because there's just so much that's better well, the edge Tiger Woods had maybe 20 years ago is t completely different now in 2023, obviously because of age, but also even if he were a great golfer now, if he were in his prime now, I'm not convinced he would be as dominant because so many players have learned how to play the power game. They have the data that informs that. They have equipment that allows them to do it. So Tiger is of that notion, hey, 
if you want the best players to stand out, don't let equipment aid worse players to being good players. Make them play more difficult golf with the equipment and the added benefit of being able to have golf courses play effectively longer with a ball that doesn't go as far and, frankly, as straight. And if that happens, then that, that's going to be good for the sport in the long haul. And he said, we can't stop the best players from getting stronger and getting faster and learning more, but we also cannot continue as a community of golf at this high level to continue to buy property like Augusta spent, what, 20 million bucks to buy a small, pl a relatively small plot of land to extend a golf hole for one week, use one week a year for by 35, 40 yards. That, that's not possible for a lot of places, and he obviously pointed that out. And if you're going to try to have that kind of arms race for land, and when those resources get more expensive and water becomes more scarce, all of a sudden golf as a sport is going to have a hard time offering the right challenge to the best players in the world. And I think that's the perspective from which he comes. That's a perspective from which I come. By the way, we, we align on this. But I don't think this is necessarily a whole ton of news. I mean, Tiger has been for a rollback for a while. Tiger and Jack have been in there. Rory joins their company as being for that. And I think that's a pretty formidable force uh, as very influential, very public players who are for the rollback. I think if Arnold Palmer were still alive, he might be heading a force of guys uh, who are vocal about being anti-rollback. He wasn't a big fan of the equipment standards. Uh, he kind of went out of their way to promote a driver that was illegal back in the day. So I, I think you, depending on who was around at what time, you might have seen uh, a different force come up, a different pro existing conditions, existing regulations force would come up. But right now, three of the best golfers ever to live are standing in solidarity thinking the, the model local rule is a good thing and it's one that needs to come into play. Now tomorrow, we're going to get Fred Ridley, who's going to come in and say, probably, I mean, I'm not trying to preface his remarks, but my guess is given his history as the USGA president at one time, that I think he's going to get on board with the rollback. Now, he could come out in the complete opposite, but whatever he says tomorrow is very important. As important, if not more so, than what Tiger said today and what Rory has said recently. And the reason that is, as we've, I think, alluded to here, is if the Masters says, we as a tournament are going to have a tournament ball if this thing goes through, and it's going to start in 2026, and here's where the ball, we're going to figure out what that ball is going to look like, but we're going to have a tournament ball. And we're going to have one manufacturer make it, or here's going to be the spec, and then everyone's going to have to follow it. Something like that, whatever that looks like. If they agree to that, and they start saying that now, and he may not tomorrow, I'm not saying that, but if he says that tomorrow, and that's what people are going to be listening for, then all of a sudden that creates a set of dominoes, because the PGA of America has to make a choice, the PGA Tour has to make a choice, presumably the USGA and the RNA have already made their choice, they're proposing the model local rule. If they're going to go through it, they sure as heck are going to have their own version of a ball for the US Open and the Open Championship. So if the Masters is on board, now you've got three or four majors, if you're the PGA of America, do you become differentiating from the other three by agreeing to play amateur equipment, even though you're the Professional Golfers Association of America? That's a weird thing to do, but it would be differentiating. If you're the PGA Tour and all the majors get on board with it, then do you put yourself in a diminished context by saying, well, we are going to play the ball that every golfer around the world can play, but except those four weeks a year that are the most important ones and we all know what they are, we got to play different equipment. That, that doesn't seem very reasonable either. So I, I think a lot hinges on what happens tomorrow if Chairman Ridley says, yes, we are going to embrace the model local rule and we are going to have a tournament ball for the Masters starting in 2026. I, I, I think that's the, the, the entire thing we're going to listen to tomorrow. Uh, there will probably be some questions for Chairman Ridley about Gary Player and his comments, maybe or maybe not. We'll see how brave someone feels trying to ask uh, a guy in a green jacket at Augusta National question that awkward but we shall see and I think that's kind of the takeaway for tomorrow we'll have the Masters Part 3 contest it's been kind of a, a, a weird show the last couple of years different rainouts different times not having it COVID all this stuff but they have a revamped renovated Part 3 course I think it's going to be pretty cool to watch and better views better viewing areas uh, if you're an agronomy geek new strain of grass on the greens that might eventually wind up on the big course which could be cool and then 
it all gets started on Thursday. Tea times are out. Weather forecast continues to look not so great. Thursday is not so, so bad, but Friday looks particularly ugly, especially in the later part of the day. And that can be enforcing a cut to Saturday. If the rain that's expected on Saturday comes, that could cause some interesting problems. Might wind ourselves in a 2019 situation, not necessarily with Tiger Woods winning, but with an awkward schedule that forces threesomes potentially off 1 in 10 to get this thing however that might work out. We shall see what all happens there, but uh, I think a lot of players are probably preparing themselves for it to potentially be a long week, one maybe filled with stopping and starting, but that you got to get the getting while you're out there, and if the conditions are good and the weather is fair and the ground is fairly soft, you've got to make your hay quickly and because you never know when the weather could change and you never know when play could be called depending on electricity in the area. So, Lots of lots of variables this week, but plenty more to look forward to tomorrow, and then the whole thing gets underway on Thursday. That's going to do it for us today on 2 at the 1st. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the show. If you catch us via podcast platform, please leave a five-star review. It helps us reach more people. If you're watching on video, especially on YouTube, smash that like button. Consider subscribing to our channel. If you're watching or listening anywhere else, thanks for doing that. Appreciate you having your time uh, for a little while today during this Master's Week. We know you got a lot of choices, so fine with us here at Southwest. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode, two out the first. I'm Ryan Balanji. Thank you for your time. We will talk to you tomorrow.